All right. Uh, so good morning. Uh, this is, uh, you know, sort of odd, of course, because you feel like you're talking to nobody. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we'll do it. This is my first Zoom lecture. Uh, I've been in a number of Zoom meetings, of course, since COVID, but this is the first time I've actually spoken to a group through this uh, means. Uh, so, uh-oh, my, oh, here we go. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start out um, by, uh, I'm going to start out by talking about a case just to sort of illustrate what these cases are like. And then I'm, then we'll talk about some uh, sort of uh, definitions and issues and how we do these investigations and uh, kind of what the victims are like, what the perpetrators are like, and then I'll, I'll share some additional cases. Okay. So first case, this is a 12 year old girl and uh, she was in the custody of an adult cousin. Uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the things we'll talk about is that most of these perpetrators are women and of course this was no exception. And in fact, I've never done a case where the, perp the uh, perpetrator wasn't a woman. So any in any case, uh, she had complaint that she was throwing up blood. So, uh, of course, uh, was referred to gastroenterology and had endoscopy, and there was no evidence of blood. Uh, there was evidence of uh, helicobacter uh, infection, not the common one that causes ulcers, but another one. So she was treated for that um, and um, then had another endoscopy, and during neither of those, was there any indication that she actually had any bleeding in her GI tract? So then the next thing she did is complained, or her actually the her guardian did, was say that she had bleeding from her belly button. I'm going to show you a picture. So uh, this is what it looked like. These are pictures that the family provided. We did not see her at this time. Uh, I reviewed all of her records later on. Uh, there's another picture. So what happened at this time when she was complaining of bleeding from her belly button is her guardian took her to her primary doctor. Uh, she didn't actually have an appointment, just kind of showed up there. And uh, the nurse there at that clinic uh, thought, well, that looks really strange. Uh, maybe I better WIAC uh, this material that was on the... Uh, on the like the tissue and uh, guaiac is a test for occult blood or for the presence of blood so she did that and it was negative so there wasn't actually any blood it was just some red stuff uh, that uh, the family put there to look like there was blood okay so the next thing she did is say hey she's got blood in her tears and so because of that, she went to the eye doctor. The eye doctor said, well, there are some complaints that can cause blood in the tears. There are some abnormalities, but what you all are describing doesn't match any of those abnormalities. Further, when the eye doctor checked her visual acuity, uh, you know, and you guys, a lot of you all have probably done this, where they say, you know, which one of these lenses improve is best, you know, number one or number two, you can't tell any difference. Uh, the, uh, the child, uh, what she said about acuity didn't match their testing. So the eye doctor concluded that the child was making up, you know, this uh, problem with visual acuity. Okay, so all of these things occurred before I knew anything about this child. And then the next thing that happened was that she started her period and then had persistent bleeding for months and months and months. And she eventually was seen at the adolescent clinic here at OU. And because of that, they asked me to, uh, you know, look at her records and see, was there an issue? 
And so um, she had gotten a lot of care for this problem with the persistent bleeding associated with her period. She had been on birth control pills. She eventually got Implanon, which is the uh, birth control that's, you know, implanted under the skin. Uh, she'd been to multiple emergency department uh, visits. And as time went on, the severity of the bleeding, the description of the severity of bleeding uh, got worse and worse. And so at one point, the guardian described that she has so much bleeding that she must have, you know, a pad or she can't sit even on the exam room table without something under because there's so much bleeding. Well, the reason that it was uh, clear that that was not the case is because she never had any anemia. And also when she was in the emergency department and she peed in a cup, urinated in a cup, uh, there was no blood there. And so those of you all who are medical folks know that you, know, you would definitely expect to see both anemia and, and blood in the urine. So, uh, because of that, we concluded that she was a victim of Munchausen by proxy. <clears throat> and so she came to see us in our clinic. And amazingly, just before she came to see us after this months and months of menstrual bleeding, it stopped. And so when we saw her, no longer bleeding. So, of course, uh, we made a report to DHS, and the plan uh, was that the one of the DHS nurses from going forward would oversee her medical care. However, that absolutely didn't work because if the nurse knew about a medical visit, the guardian um, canceled it and then would schedule medical visits that the nurse didn't know about. So that, that really didn't work as a method to make this stop. Okay, so then kind of life went on and uh, they, her guardian again complained that she was vomiting blood. Now this child got all of her medical care kind of here through our OU medical system, which made it a lot easier for me to do this evaluation. A lot of times they're getting care all different places and it's really hard to follow the records. But in this case, that wasn't what happened. So when she complained of vomiting blood again, uh, she was still seeing a GI doctor here, but it was someone different. And so some period of time had passed. And so this new doctor said, well, we better do endoscopy. So again, there was no blood. However, you know, you all may know that to prepare for endoscopy, you need to clean everything out. You got to get the stomach empty and the intestine empty or else you can't see. Uh, and what they found when they did the endoscopy was that the clean out wasn't very good. So because of that, they worried uh, that this kid um, had delayed gastric emptying because she had food in her stomach. And uh, so a gastric emptying study was, was uh, ordered. And so during that study, uh, what, what the child does is uh, eat some food that contains a radio tracer. And at that time, either she had an allergic reaction or she acted like she did. And she may have actually had an allergic reaction. So because, and, and she seemed to have uh, like hives and wheezing. So she went to the emergency department and was ultimately um, admitted to the hospital. And she was on IV steroids and antihistamines to treat this. But when she was in the hospital, she continued to be symptomatic despite this very aggressive therapy. And so uh, the doctors in the hospital felt like, well, why is that happening? So they consulted an allergist who was worried that she had a disorder in which she had an excessive allergic reaction. Uh, it's called mastocytosis. Um, uh, that was in, uh, uh, disproportionate to what was necessary. And so the next 
the plan, the next step was to do a bone marrow biopsy, which is, you know, a significant test because what that involves is putting a really pretty significant needle right into your bone and, and uh, aspirating out bone marrow. So that actually didn't happen uh, because the DHS nurse that had previously been involved ultimately got notified that she was in the hospital and that was going on. So at that point, uh, what happened was they, they removed the child from the guardian and placed her with the guardian's adult daughter. Now, you know, some of you all might be able to predict that maybe that wasn't going to go very well. Uh, for one thing, uh, maybe this adult daughter herself had been a victim of Munchausen. But uh, even if it wasn't predictable, um, what happened then is the new caretaker, this daughter, uh, called us and said, hey, I need to know what the therapy is that she's supposed to be taking. And so we said, well, come in and we'll discuss it. Uh, one of the things that was happening is that the, the guardian was still you know, uh, guiding the medical care, even though the child was no longer in her care. So uh, the adult daughter comes in and again shows us picture of this child having hives and also of her throwing up blood. Uh, well, of course, the picture she showed us didn't look like hives and the throwing up blood was again something red, pardon me, on a tissue. And so it was clear at that point that it wasn't going to work for this kid to be cared for by that person. And she was finally placed in foster care. And once she was, um, then there were no further problems. The child was well. And eventually the child said, um, hey, um, I guess if I'm not sick anymore, then I'll never go back to my, what she considered to be her mother, which was her guardian. And in fact, that's what happened. Uh, I was um, invited to come to court, both at show cause, so very early in the case, but uh, the, uh, the guardian said, no, I'll go ahead and do what you all say. And then eventually there was a court action to, um, uh, uh, for her to, uh, to dissolve the guardianship, uh, but the guardian surrendered her. And so she thereafter remained in foster care and then never had any more medical issues. So uh, this is, you know, a fairly uh, sort of common way these cases present. Uh, it's... Uh, so we're going to go ahead and talk about the terminology and the way this occurs and that kind of thing. And this will kind of, we'll maybe refer back to this case as we go. Whoops, something went wrong. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So the terminology, um, what has happened uh, with Munchausen by proxy terminology is um, there maybe, maybe has been some confusion and sometimes maybe people don't know what these various terms mean. Um, and I'll, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about why that is. Okay, so uh, the initial term was simply Munchausen. And Munchausen just had to do with people making up their own disease. And uh, the, the name came from um, uh, uh, stories that were written about a real person, but the stories were sort of exaggerated. And this guy, Count Munchausen, he made stuff up. And so that's how that terminology came to be associated with this syndrome. And then of course, by proxy meant somebody else was doing it. In the, and in this case, the caretaker. And so uh, along the way through maybe the last 20, well, be longer than that, maybe 30, 40 years, uh, maybe not quite that long, 
uh, people made a big deal about whether it should be Munchausen syndrome by proxy or Munchausen by proxy syndrome, but really those things, it probably doesn't make a lot of difference. Um, the Munchausen by proxy historically was used to indicate the disease of the perpetrator. And so because of that, that meant people like me, child abuse pediatricians, we would not make that diagnosis because we were not diagnosing the perpetrator. Um, and so, uh, so we had to have terminology that referred to the child. And we'll talk about that in, the, in a minute. Um, there, was, there were also issues historically that said, hey, Munchausen by proxy means that the perpetrator is doing this uh, for their, because of their own psychological need and there isn't any other gain. So the point was that if somebody was making up disease to get money or to get medicine or things like that, then that precluded the diagnosis. And so that made things more complicated probably than they needed to be. On the other hand, as we started to use these other terms, nobody knew what you were talking about because everybody in you know, common use was familiar with the term Munchausen by proxy, but not with these other terms. And so uh, the American uh, Professional Society on the Abuse of Children um, published uh, some guidelines, uh, which maybe you will receive a copy of. I will talk about that at the end. Um, and um, what they said is, hey, the way we're going to use this is just to talk about this whole issue. So we're going to use this term to talk about the child, the perpetrator, and the whole issue that's happening in which somebody either causes a kid to be sick or portrays them as having an illness that they don't have or portrays them as having an illness that is worse than the, the uh, illness that they actually have. And so that makes things easier for us to talk about. Okay, so still, uh, because um, Munchausen by proxy is not really a diagnosis like in DSM, it never has been, uh, if I'm going to make a diagnosis, I don't use that term. But if I'm talking to people, I might use the term. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay. All right, so the actual DSM-5 diagnosis of the perpetrator is factitious disorder imposed on another. And so you'll see that there's a lot of words in all of this stuff and consequently a lot of uh, letters that we use instead. And so it's used to describe the psychopathology um, and it, there is, it, uh, there has to be intentional deception and that certainly is true. And some of the things that I do when I'm trying to evaluate these cases is try to sort out if clearly there's deception. And uh, the, the needs of the child are sort of ignored. Uh, it seems that the child often is considered sort of a possession and uh, the perpetrator kind of feels like, well, they're okay with, with doing this. Uh, and the, this whole issue of excluding the diagnosis if there is uh, some other reward like uh, other than psychological like money or something like that is no longer excluded. There may not be anything like that, but there could be. And so that really has simplified things. Okay, now for us as, as uh, people taking care of kids, uh, if, if our patient is the child, uh, then we use these terms. So uh, the one that I now use most commonly is pediatric condition falsification and we'll uh, uh, 
but uh, some people have said, well, we should call it abuse by pediatric condition falsification, or we could call it caregiver fabricated illness in a child. And so clearly, to some degree, as we've used these terms, um, maybe we haven't made things clearer, but still we have to adhere to these other terms uh, so it's clear that we're making a diagnosis of the child. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about medical child abuse in just a minute. Okay, so uh, that being said, uh, this is, I've been using this for a number of years, um, we have to remember that if we're going to call, if we're going to diagnose a child with pediatric condition falsification, it has to be pretty significant. So it's not just, uh, and for those of you all who actually provide probably mental health care or medical care for kids, you know that there are some moms that, uh, you know, the kid, you know, has to be almost uh, uh, collapsed before they bring them in. And uh, that's still maybe within the range of normal. And there's moms that as soon as the, the kid may have had a fever for two hours and they're in the office, and so they're, you know, overzealous, uh, some moms who might just exaggerate the symptoms kind of a little bit, uh, those really wouldn't fit into this diagnosis. Uh, it's really ones who either greatly, repeatedly exaggerate the symptoms, make up symptoms, or actually cause illness. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Now, medical child abuse. Uh, the term medical child abuse also came about because of all this issue about, well, we can't diagnose them with Munchausen because that's the perpetrator. And also we want to get away from this idea of whether the mother is getting some kind of benefit from it. And so uh, Carol Jenny, very well known child abuse pediatrician, uh, came up with, she and her husband actually, who's a mental health provider, a psychiatrist, uh, wrote a book in which they talked about medical child abuse. And so they characterized medical child abuse as, as medical care that's unnecessary, harmful or potentially harmful, and the result of action on the part of the caretaker. And so uh, this is also a commonly used term. Uh, but Sometimes uh, victims of uh, pediatric condition falsification aren't really getting that much harmful medical care. And so it, um, sometimes I think pediatric condition falsification is, is a better term, particularly in those situations. Okay, so, um, so this is from that guideline put out by uh, American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. And so uh, this is a table that talks about, well, how is this done? And so these are the ways. And so providing uh, false information, um, you know, it could be that they say the child had a seizure when they didn't in the case that I just showed you. I think uh, the guardian said this child had blood from all these various places when in reality she didn't. And so uh, that, that's probably the most common form of um, uh, way that uh, uh, pediatric condition falsification occurs. Now there could also be withholding information, like I gave a medicine that caused a symptom in the child, but I didn't tell you I did that. It could also be, which kind of overlaps with neglect, that uh, the child has a seizure disorder and the medicine is prescribed, but the medicine isn't given. And um, therefore, it's assumed that that medicine didn't work when the child continues to have symptoms. It could also be exaggeration. And again, that would be pretty uh, dramatic exaggeration. So to give you an example, 
um, there was, uh, I did a case in which a child uh, had been documented to have uh, a couple of seizures early in life. Um, it was unclear whether there were ever any more, but there were documented seizures and the child actually seized in the emergency department and was witnessed by medical professionals. However, uh, that child went on to be on uh, like 15 different seizure medicines, none of which worked. And um, the history that was uh, provided uh, at one time when the child came to the emergency department is that uh, the child had had five seizures at home, had been treated with uh, diazepam, Valium, uh, diastat, rectally, uh, five times. But by the time uh, the uh, uh, EMS arrived, uh, the child looked perfectly fine and was perfectly alert. And we would not at all expect that in a child who had five seizures and had been treated five times with diastat. So even though there had been a seizure, this was now either exaggerated or maybe this seizure itself was made up. Okay, simulation means that we, the perpetrator makes it look like there's a disease. So these are the cases that maybe you all have heard about in which uh, the mother uh, puts something in the urine sample, like her own blood, maybe it's menstrual blood, maybe it's something else. Um, and it makes it look like the child has a urinary infection or, or something like that. Okay, neglect we kind of talked about a minute ago, which means that um, you know, maybe the therapy isn't given. And, you know, you might think, well, gosh, that doesn't make sense. They're exaggerating this illness. They're uh, reporting illness maybe that's not there, but then when they get prescribed something, they don't give it. But that is actually very common in uh, Munchausen cases. Uh, induction is they actually create illness. So these are cases that I think a lot of people think about when they're talking about Munchausen cases in which kids are starved, uh, they're suffocated, they're given something that actually causes an infection, they're given something that maybe causes them to throw up. Uh, that's actually somebody creating, causing the child to be ill when they otherwise wouldn't have been. And coaching uh, is, you know, probably we saw it in the previous case because the girl was 12 years old. And you might think, well, you know, this is a disease primarily of very young kids because as the kid gets older, they can say, no, those things aren't wrong with me. But oftentimes, uh, by then, the problem has been going on a long time and the child has been convinced that those problems really are there. And uh, so the child may also report the symptoms. In the case that I presented, uh, when we talked to the child, she kind of parroted what her guardian said but for the most part, she didn't want to engage uh, in that discussion. She said, oh, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, you should talk to my mom about it uh, because it was too difficult for her to recount all this stuff. Okay, so what kind of conditions are um, common? Well, it could be uh, medical, it could be psychological, psychological or behavioral, and certainly we've seen that. Um, I took care of a kid in which uh, she had pretty significant disease, but her mother said she was also autistic, which she was not. Uh, it might be exaggeration of developmental disorders, but it commonly is uh, disorders that are difficult to easily rule out. So, you know, for the most part, people uh, don't say, oh, uh, I brought him here because he has strep throat uh, as part of something that they're going to falsify because that's easy to test for. So it's these things that are based on symptoms and uh, things that are difficult to 
to test. Uh, seizures are common, neurologic problems are common. Um, the other thing that can happen is that uh, there could also be real disease. So as we investigate these, uh, a lot of times people will say to me when I'm talking to them about a Munchausen case, they'll say, oh, so the kid was completely healthy. And that, that's not a requirement. There could actually be real disease that is either exaggerated or it could be that there's real disease, but the mother is presenting other things. So again, uh, I took care of a kid who had septo-optic dysplasia. Uh, so anyway, she was blind. Uh, septo-optic dysplasia is kind of a malformation of midline structures. And so she was blind and she had growth hormone deficiency, steroid deficiency, and thyroid deficiency. And those were all real things. But her mother also portrayed her as being autistic, uh, being uh, physically disabled, which she was not, and having seizures. And she didn't have seizures. Uh, so it's, it's hard to believe that you know, this kid with such complex disease, that wasn't enough, and her mother created yet other disease, or portrayed her as having yet other disease. Okay, so what's the harm? Uh, well, there could be direct harm because the mother caused illness, uh, particularly in suffocation cases, uh, there is, of course, a mortality rate, and we'll talk about that. Um, also, unnecessary uh, invasive procedures and, you know, could be tests or treatments. There could be iatrogenic illness, so Ill illness that's con created by medical care. So, you know, when we talk about medical care, we always talk about the risk versus the benefit, and that means there's risk. And so, you know, you could just like... Uh, uh, you could have an allergic reaction to something, you could have an uh, anesthesia reaction, all of these things. Uh, probably, well, at least in some of these cases, uh, the more harmful effect is their own uh, misunderstanding of their health and uh, psychological harm. And because of the time they spend in medical care, maybe in the hospital or maybe in other activities, they may miss educational and social opportunities. Uh, some of these kids, of course, are removed from school. Uh, and in fact, this 12 year old was not in school because of all these medical problems she was having. And again, like I said, there is a mortality rate. Okay. So uh, what are these perpetrators like? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, they're more commonly uh, women. Uh, there's a high rate of personality disorders. There's a high rate of that they uh, portray themselves as having illnesses that they don't have and lower rates of self-destruct, self-harm, substance misuse and surprisingly learning problems. And I, th I think we're surprised about that because often we think of these perpetrators as being very uh, familiar with uh, medical literature and uh, very convincing that the child has these medical problems. Okay, so what kind of things indicate that there's a problem? Well, I think uh, things that indicate it is, are um, that, you know, uh, the treatment that ordinarily would work doesn't work. Other things are unusual clinical presentation. And I think what indicates it to a lot of people is just that this kid seems fairly well, but yet they keep having medical test after medical test or medical visit after medical visit. Okay. So what do we do to evaluate these? I think a lot of people think, well, what we do is we always just do video surveillance. But most of the time, uh, because the most common way this is carried out is through exaggeration of symptoms or reporting symptoms that are uh, not present, video surveillance doesn't really help us, uh, you know, because we're not uh, seeing somebody 
suffocate the child or put something in the IV or things like that. So much more commonly, uh, the assessment is through review of tons and tons of medical records. And that review of medical records takes a lot of time. The other thing sometimes that's necessary is separation from the abuser and then does the child get better? Okay, so uh, this is what we do. Uh, this is just um, the, uh, from that, those guidelines, um, this is a way that we record all of these medical visits so that it makes some kind of sense. And so it's important, uh, important things here are, are one of the, are the caregiver's report. So what did the perpetrator, the mother, the grandmother who's in a mother role, what did she say was wrong? And then what does the actual test or the exam show? And then what was the resultant treatment? And, you know, when I do some of these cases, they can be uh, pages and pages and pages, 20 pages of, uh, you know, even though it's just a short description of each medical visit, there's so many medical visits and there's so much medical care that it turns out to be pages and pages. Okay. All right. So what do we need to do when we do this? Uh, well, basically we're looking for uh, discrepancies. So was the mother told, like I did a case just recently in which uh, the mother kept telling medical providers that this child, nine-year-old child, had cystic fibrosis. Well, it was clearly documented uh, that the, the sweat test, which is the, for the screening test, was kind of borderline, but they went on and did genetic testing, and clearly the genetic testing was normal and the mother was told that the child didn't have cystic fibrosis. So clearly she is portraying the child as having things that she doesn't have. Uh, so that's kind of the sort of things that we're looking at. Okay, and then uh, what about child protection? What do we do once we have the issue? Uh, well, um, the, probably the most important thing is that we separate the child from the abuser. And, uh, you know, I think that's really hard uh, for um, child welfare, DHS folks to, to do uh, because it seems like, well, you know, nobody beat this kid up and it's hard to understand how uh, this mother who seems to care of the to care about the child could be doing that. But unless we uh, separate them, as was illustrated in the previous case, the, uh, uh, the abuse can continue. They can continue to get medical care for the child. And uh, there's a study that shows even in the hospital, uh, after the problem has been identified in about half the cases uh, they continue to portray the child as have an illness that they don't have. Um, and uh, you have to consider that the siblings may also be, need to be protected. Um, and then there should only be re reunification after successful therapy, which brings up the issue of, well, what is successful therapy? And base, I'm going to skip through that. Uh, basically, the perpetrator, if they're going to get better, of course, they have to uh, identify that they have a problem. And uh, we've had the literature kind of shows that uh, therapy is difficult uh, and is often unsuccessful. And um, the other thing that is particularly difficult in these cases is, you know, it's felt that a mental health provider uh, should diagnose these, these perpetrators and then be able to treat them. And so we're commonly looking for a mental health provider to evaluate these perpetrators, uh, which certainly can be difficult to find. The other issue is uh, that 
for the mental health provider, the psychologist or the psychiatrist to make an appropriate diagnosis and to determine that this is going on, uh, they really need information from outside of only uh, that parent who's doing it. Uh, because oftentimes those people uh, appear that there aren't any problems. So really, we must always share the rest of the information with that mental health provider. And uh, so that means that uh, the system, DHS, uh, if you know, they're involved, must be involved with uh, the communication with that mental health provider. Okay. All right. So mortality is anywhere from about six to about 9%. Um, it's possible that this mortality is overstated because maybe we miss a lot of cases of Munchausen. We probably do. Uh, but nevertheless, the studies that have been done, the series show that kind of mortality. Okay. Um, all right, I'm gonna, in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna skip to another case because I think a lot of times uh, cases kind of can be uh, more illustrative than, you know, the data. Uh, what these several slides are, um, and I think that you can get this PowerPoint, but they're summaries of some case series uh, in regards to Munchausen. And they talk about some of the things that we already talked about. Uh, they talk about that these victim children are continue to be at risk if they remain with their mother. Uh, they also talk about that many of these perpetrators suffered pretty significant psychological and maybe other forms of abuse in childhood. And many of them uh, grew up in a family uh, in which they had lost a parent. So uh, those are kind of the salient points. All right, so I'm going to talk about a couple other, or maybe only one, uh, well, hopefully two, uh, other cases. Um, so uh, uh, this is um, a mom who was portraying her child as having uh, cancer. And um, she, they had in her community, uh, this is from public information, so that's why I can, of course, share it. It's from an online newspaper. Uh, but uh, in, in her community, they had had golf tournaments and uh, various fundraisers to try to support this family because this child had cancer. Very important in helping this family was, was their church, and they were the ones who helped uh, organize these events to raise money for this child. Uh, eventually, uh, this mother portrayed this child as being terminal, and, uh, you know, she said, we're going to someplace and uh, uh, have uh, stem cell therapy and all of these things. But what caused it to unravel is, again, the church was very involved with, it, with this family, and members of the church eventually uh, said, hey, for a child who is terminal, she doesn't look very sick. And they eventually called the police in, in Enid, and then it was investigated. Uh, this mother did not bring this child for a lot of unnecessary medical care, and she did clearly have um, a benefit, a tangible benefit besides psychological, um, because she had received significant amount of money uh, from, from portraying this child as being terminal. So what happened in this case is there was a father who... Uh, uh, wasn't uh, involved in, in perpetrating this. And um, so the child who was being portrayed as being terminal actually just went into the care of, of her father and was completely separated from the mother. 
the mother had some other children and they too went to their fathers. And I, I didn't mention earlier, uh, because you might wonder, well, how, what role do these fathers have? Um, the fathers usually are either not involved or they're not involved in the medical care. So uh, it, many of you probably have spoken with fathers who say, uh, and any of you who are medical providers, have probably had occasion for a father to bring a child in and you're trying to get history. And he says, gosh, I don't know about that. My, my wife always takes care of that or her mother always takes care of that. And so it certainly can be that the fathers just are completely unaware and they're as taken in as, um, as, uh, as are the medical providers and everybody else. And so sometimes these kids can go to their father. So what happened in this case is there was very minimal, so my role was pretty small in, in this case, but there was some uh, portrayal of this child in the medical setting as having illness that she didn't have. But there was much more portrayal on social media and all of these things. And so this mother was charged with fraud and also child abuse. And she pled out, she was willing to plead out in regards to the fraud, but she didn't want to admit the child abuse, though she was eventually also convicted in regards to child abuse. Um, um, this is another case in which the mother portrayed this child as having many, many medical problems cardiomegaly, tracheomalacia, hearing loss, and uh, this was portrayed over a number of years. Uh, and when you went back and reviewed the medical records, it was clear that this child didn't have these things. But um, uh, club feet, uh, she reported, and you might think, well, how could you say a kid had club feet? Anybody could look and say there wasn't. Uh, but uh, what happened was she would go to a new medical provider and say she had already been diagnosed and she was already receiving therapy for it, and so the medical provider then would prescribe more therapy. Uh, so um, the way that she did it was that um, there were two, she changed back and forth between primary care providers and she also obtained care at two different hospital systems. So she sometimes, uh, this was here in Oklahoma City, so she uh, got care here at OU, but also got care at the Integris Medical System at Baptist. And the same was true, uh, and, and that extended to the medical providers, the primary care doctor and the specialists, and also the hospitals. And uh, this mother even took this child out of medical care against advice. And uh, um, I did eventually, uh, what happened in the case was it was clear that this child had been a significant victim um, and uh, there were actually eventually two DHS referrals, but once at, when the second referral occurred, we were asked to review the records and it, it was pretty clear that uh, she was a victim. Uh, the child was, was placed in foster care uh, because the second parent uh, believed that, you know, was not protective initially. So the child went to foster care. However, uh, she was eventually returned to those parents and the non-offending parent came and met with me. And what she said when she came to see me was that, oh, well, her uh, partner had, had made um, mistakes. And I had to explain to her, no, uh, those weren't mistakes. And explain to her that her partner had actually portrayed this child as having thing, having illnesses that she didn't actually have, and that you know how important her role was going to be in protecting this child if they were going to remain together. Okay, so I think uh, that brings us to uh, time for questions. Um, so 
whatever questions uh, folks might have or comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stockett. We will give uh, um, the people a few seconds to see if they have questions. I just want to make some corrections. So I said that we have another session with Dr. Stockett about marijuana with on, on children. And she said this one to me, yes, it's not next week. Uh, it's on June 18, two weeks from now, we will have um, another session with Dr. Stockett. So you can keep tracking our links and doing the registration if you want to join us for uh, that lecture. Um, thank you, Dr. Stockett, so much. And I see that already we have questions. So I will mute myself and Christina, you can start. All right, so the first question we have is, could you speak to why a mom would choose one child rather than another sibling case? Um, well, probably I don't really know the answer. <laughs> but it could be that the child who is targeted has uh, some kind of underlying illness and they exaggerate it or had some symptoms early in life and uh, you know, I, at least I have seen cases like that. Uh, there certainly could be other reasons, but what they are, I'm not sure. Uh, there is a pretty high rate of other children in the family also being targeted about, I think the studies show about half of the other children are also targeted. Uh, I did a case recently in which the mother had four children uh, for uh, one of them was older and so he may have been targeted. We didn't know. Two children, she said, had the same disease that neither one had. And then another one, she said, had some different things. So clearly at least three of the four were, were uh, also were abused. Thank you. The next question is, are victims split easily I think they mean evenly between males and females. Examples given today seem to be female. Uh, yeah, these uh, were females, uh, but yes, I think they're pretty evenly split. Uh, I would guess, though I don't really have data, that uh, the majority of older victims that I've, I've seen are girls. Um, and I do think uh, that we probably see uh, victims that are girls go on to continue to uh, have uh, their own uh, making up illness in adulthood. Thank you. So the next question is, what is the most beneficial things or actions you've seen or heard from mental health professionals within these cases? Uh, well, so uh, in regards to mental health, I think there's two issues. One is, of course, the mental health of the child. And they clearly need, uh, you know, and again, I'm not a mental health prevent, uh, provider, but they definitely need uh, some kind of therapy, I guess I would guess it's probably cognitive behavioral therapy, to teach them uh, what is real and, you know, what's not real. The uh, mental, the uh, therapy for the perpetrator, you know, I think it really depends on receiving information from the outside, not just from uh, the perpetrator, because they commonly do not admit there could be a criminal case, there could be a child welfare case. And uh, so that diagnosis has to be based on um, other information from the outside. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I can't imagine, uh, because I don't do it, how difficult that is because you know, if you're treating this mom, you have to somehow be able to form some kind of uh, relationship. And if what you're doing is saying, hey, I have all this information that indicates you did this, uh, what are we going to do about it? I, I don't know how well that goes. But um, one of the things that's important to realize is that if there is a diagnosis of maltreatment of the child based on for example, review of the medical records and things like that, uh, the 
because there isn't a diagnosis of the mother does not make that go away. Uh, the idea with the diagnosis of the mother is to figure out can we treat her and therefore eventually be able to reunite the child with the perpetrator, uh, though often that's not very successful. We do need those providers though. Thank you. So the next question, it seems that these cases can be very difficult to prove at times. What is your advice for care team members when they suspect this is happening beyond making the initial abuse or neglect referral, but don't have enough evidence for removal or other interventions? Um, yeah, that's, that's really difficult. Um, you know, it, it, it's kind of, uh, you are in a difficult position. If uh, you aren't, I, I would say one thing we should do is have a medical evaluation of the medical records and the child. And if there's not enough information based on that, uh, then there's probably not a lot that can be done unless there's a new incident. And at that point we can show that something's going on. Now, uh, the guidelines would say, um, can we separate the child from the perpetrator and see if all these problems get better? And that would be useful, but that might be very hard to do because the court may not order it if we don't have adequate information. Uh, one thing that has happened in some of these cases is if there's a non-offending parent, I have sometimes, uh, some of the workers have spoken with that non-offending parent and said, hey, you need to go to court and get custody of this child. And uh, so sometimes that is helpful, uh, you know, because maybe the burden of proof isn't as high to be able to have that other parent get custody uh, rather than DHS being able to say there's actually a problem if that makes sense. We had another question. Is this an international problem? Uh, yes, uh, for sure, because some of these uh, studies are from other countries. Um, the guy who first described this, his name, well, in recent times, the guy who first described it, his name is Roy Meadows and he's from uh, England. So definitely international. Do you yeah, have I can also say that in Israel we had some very uh, famous cases. Yeah. Thank you, Gal. Um, do you have book suggestions for reading more about this subject? Um, well, the first thing I would read are those APSAC guidelines, American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children. It's about a 30 page document um, and it's uh, very good, you know, it's pretty succinct. Uh, the other uh, reference I would say is the book called, it's called, I think it's called Medical Child Abuse by Carol Jenny and her husband. Um, and it's, it's very good as well. Thank you. Um, you mentioned parents saying child has autism, et cetera, when they don't. Do you know of any research into parents doing what I have called, my made up name, Munchausen by special education? <laughs> uh, I haven't myself worked on a case like that, but yes, I, th I think they do occur and they are reported in the literature. Uh, they just report that the child is more disabled than they are. Um, and actually I say that, but that's not true. Um, the, um, this case that I talked about um, in which the kid had septo-optic dysplasia, uh, that kid, when she went to foster care, was in a wheelchair. And um, by the time her foster mother was a nurse and she knew what was, she, anyway, it's a long story, but uh, she sort of rehabilitated her. And that kid, uh, after being in the foster home, was swimming in the swimming pool and riding the 
like a big wheel, which is sort of like a tricycle. Um, the, the sort of tragic thing about that case is as the child got rid of a gastrostomy tube that she didn't need and got off all these medicines that she didn't need, her foster mother would tell her, well, um, well, you got better, you got better. And so the child one time asked the foster mother, well, uh, when will I get better and I won't be blind anymore? But she would never uh, because she had hypoplasia, hypoplasia of her optic nerves. And so it was sad. Okay, this is noon and uh, we need to finish, unfortunately. Uh, I hope that uh, we were able to answer all the questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Stockett, uh, for this session, this very important session. And uh, I'm inviting you to do stop share and you can um, just look at the chat and I can okay. also send you a record of the chat later so you can also. So uh, let me ask you, will, will the participants be sent those guidelines? Is that something that can be done? Yeah, I send them already the guidelines and I will great. send them now the presentation. Okay, great, great. Thank Very you good. so much and see you. see you in two weeks. Okay, great. Thank you.